Just one moment, I seem to have left my notes down there somewhere, Pam, have I? Uh, oh, I've got them. <laughs> I talk about my notes. <laughs> That's a, a, a euphemism, because <laughs> some people who looked at my notes and wonder how ever anybody could ever preach from them. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's just a guide to keep one on the line. Let's just have a word of prayer before we turn to this precious word of God. Lord Jesus, we've been admiring the grace of the Father of which thy coming was such a glorious expression. And we ask, Lord, that thou wilt give us once again a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of thee. We ask it in thy dear name. Amen. Now I want to turn you to the book of Deuteronomy. I'm very aware of the fact that this is our last meeting at this particular time together. And I believe the Lord has led to this, what I hope will be a very precious subject. Deuteronomy chapter 11, and we're going to read a few verses from chapter 10. Now Deuteronomy sounds a rather long word, and you might be a bit put off really studying the book of Deuteronomy. But actually, it's one of the most easily read books of the Old Testament. It flows along so easily and simply. It really is the subject, the, the, the condensed matter of several long messages which Moses gave to the people of Israel as they came to the end of that 40 years wandering in the wilderness. He led them for so long. They turned away from that land 40 years before because of unbelief. And God disciplined them and condemned them to remain 40 years in the wilderness until that generation had died out, that unbelieving generation, and the new generation was ready to enter that land of promise. And Moses is concerned that they shall not blow it again. He's concerned that they shall learn from the past and from their fathers. And he gives a very lucid summary of how things went with their fathers, especially of that sad day 40 years before when they despised the pleasant land and refused to go in at Kadesh Barnea. And he draws many a lesson for them. He's so concerned that they won't again turn from the Lord after they have entered in and find themselves being scattered and taken into captivity. And so it's a great uh, series of great moral injunctions to them to see to it that this time they love the Lord with all their God and they turn not aside to idols, but go in and possess and enjoy that land that was promised to them. And he has various arguments he uses. And one argument is quoted here. He has been enjoining them on the necessity of obedience to the Lord, and then he uses this argument, verse 10, For the land, whither thou goest in to possess it, is not as the land of Egypt, from whence she came out, where thou sowest thy seed, and waterest it with thy foot, as a garden of herbs. But the land whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. And it shall come to pass, if ye shall diligently hearken unto my commandments which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season. The first rain and the latter rain, two rainy seasons. The one immediately after the sowing had taken place and then later in the year, in the fall, immediately before the reaping. Just the two seasons when it was most needed 
to cause the seed to fructify in the first place and before harvest to plump the grain ready for harvest. And if they really obeyed the Lord and loved him with all their heart, God would give them their rain in its two proper seasons, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless she perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. And its appropriateness to me, its appropriateness to us is this, we are, so to speak, about to enter a new land. Some of us have had a new meeting with the Lord Jesus. We've had a new revelation of him and of grace and of what redemption's all about and how we can experience constant redemption in our walk with him. And many of us are praising the Lord for this new vision, this new meeting we've had with him. And we're going in to the promised land of the future. And we're in much the same position as Israel was when Moses addressed his messages to them about to enter the promised land. And I'm just going to call it the promised land of the future. And he's got to say, and it has some things to tell them about the land whither ye go in to possess it. And this is, you're, you're going to find this, I believe, not only interesting, but tremendously applicable to your own experience. He says in this passage that the land whither you go in to possess it is going to differ from the land of Egypt from which you came out in one matter, in the matter of its irrigation. I read you the appropriate verse. For the land whither thou goest in to possess it is not as the land of Egypt, is going to differ in many respects, in particular as to how it was watered. When she came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. But the land to which you go is not going to be irrigated in the same way as you knew it in Egypt. Well, how was the land of Egypt irrigated? It's a desert land even to this day and it would be absolutely incapable of sustaining a large population but for the fact there runs through it the great river Nile. Either side of that river is arid desert. But right from early days, by means of laborious processes, the inhabitants somehow made that one river irrigate quite a considerable portion of the land on either side of it. By, di by dint of much toil and skill, they built any number of channels as far out as they could into which the water flowed. And then from those main channels, they dug sub-channels, and the water went into that. And from those sub-channels, yet other channels too. So that ultimately, every man's field, either side of the river Nile, was watered by one of these channels. And he, as it says here, watered it with his foot. With his foot, he could either close a channel by drawing the earth over it, or open it, as what it says. That land of Egypt, where thou waterest thy seed, where thou sowest thy seed, and then watered it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. It was a great, it was a great uh, engineering feat hundreds if not thousands of square miles either side were irrigated by means of this method. Of course it was, uh, it involved a great deal of work, it involved constant maintenance and much else, but they did at least get some water and they did at least succeed in raising crops. And to this day, when you fly over the Nile, I've done it once, and as we woke up that morning and looked down, there we saw the, the, the Nile, there we saw 
the desert either side, and either side of the Nile was there this green strip which was irrigated by these channels dug very carefully out from the main river. Now, says Moses, the land to which you're going is not going to be watered that way at all. Because the land with you go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water the rain of heaven. It's going to be a land that doesn't need a river Nile. It's going to have a plentiful and regular rainfall. And there's going to be plenty for the cattle, plenty of grass and plenty for your crop. The former and the latter rain are going to fall at their appropriate seasons. And how much better then, that's what he was getting at, is the land to which you go, from the other land which had to be irrigated with such toil and effort, this is going to drink water of the rain of heaven. And it was for that reason infinitely desirable. Now I'm going to say, I imagine, I'm trust I'm right in saying that most of us, if not all, have had an experience of coming out of Egypt, of coming out of that old life into which you were born as a son of fallen Adam. And you have been brought into a new life in Christ. And there's one thing in which the new life that you receive in Jesus differs from the old life in the world and that is the manner of its irrigation. When you were in the world, away from God, how did you get on? Well, really and truly you say, not too badly. Oh, ultimately I got fed up. But really, I know exactly. Do you know what? You had the Nile. The river Nile was the means by which that old life was irrigated. Of course, it involved you in a good deal of labor, and you had to dip your hand pretty deep in your pocket to drink water of the, of the river of the world's pleasures. But you did get a bit of fun. You did get something to get you your mind off gloomy things when you were there in the world. Yes, you, you, you paid your money, you stayed up late at night, you had a hangover, you were a bit blear-eyed at, at, at sometimes, but as I say, you did get something of a sort. Admitty, admittedly, the water was a bit muddy and often smelly, but it was better than nothing. <laughs> and that's how it is for the people in the world. They are dependent on the Nile, the river of the pleasures of this world. But it does involve pretty hard work, keeping it up, forever going out, and it can be very costly indeed. Not so the life in Jesus. It's going to differ from that old life in one great particular. You're going to drink water, not from the muddy river of the Nile, by means of much human expenditure and effort. You're going to drink water of the rain of heaven. It's going to be a life which is going to be watered from above showers of blessing, the Holy Spirit working in your life, making Jesus real, and you get wonderful satisfaction. And above all, without the toil that was necessary in the world. I'm thinking of what Jesus said to that woman at the well. The water that I shall give you is going to be so different from the water you've been getting out of this well. You've needed to have an apparatus for it. You had to have a whole business, a sort of engineering little thing, pretty elementary, but it was quite advanced for those days, a sort of structure with a, with a cranking handle and so on, and she had to have a water pot. You're going to have water without all that. There's going to be within you, my dear woman, he said, a spring which is going to leap up into everlasting life and you won't need a water pot. And sure enough, when she went to call... The, her friends to come and meet this wonderful new teacher, we read, the woman left her water pot because if what Jesus said was, said was true, there was no need of it. She was going to drink of that living spring, which is God's gift to us of his Holy Spirit. And so here is an exact parallel. The new life 
that you've received in Jesus and into which you're going in coming days is going to differ from the old life in the world by the manner of its irrigation. You're going to be, be fed and sustained and empowered and satisfied with water from the rain of heaven by the blessed Holy Spirit who's going to not come down so much because he's already come down. He came down at Pentecost. But that spring is within you. And without toil on your part, that spring is going to leap up and the desires of your heart and mind are going to be fed. Oh, oh, how much better is it to live in Kenya than to live in Egypt, if that is the situation. And the poor people in Egypt have got to go on, toiling away. They know no better than to go out this, to this, that and the other and pay their money. And even then, all they get is muddy, smelly water from the Nile, while we are enjoying showers of blessing, the Holy Spirit's living water. And that so easily and that completely gratis. Now, the fact that this was how it was going to be in the promised land meant that Israel, once they got in, were going to be dependent on the Lord himself in a way they never were in Egypt. When they were in Egypt, there was, there was always the Nile there. It didn't matter very much what their relationship to God was. It wasn't really very important. A bit more sin, more or less, wouldn't make any difference because there was always the Nile there. But once they'd been brought into this land of promise, their relationship to God was all important. For if, having got in, and parted with the river Nile. They should turn aside unto idols. Then, as it says here, the, Lord, the wrath of the Lord might well be kindled against them, and he might see fit to shut up heaven that there be no rain. And then, their position was far worse than it was in Egypt. In Egypt, they always had the Nile. And they could always count on the reign of heaven in the land if they were walking with the law, but if they failed to. And if he, to discipline them, shut up heaven that there be no reign, then they got nothing. They, couldn't, they, they, they turned their back on the Nile. That was hundreds of miles away. And they could be in a worse condition afterwards. What appeared at first sight to be so infinitely pre preferable, and it was, if things went wrong and they didn't know how to get things right again, they would be in a pretty sticky situation. And so with this wonderful new life in Christ, once you've ventured into it, rightly understood, you are dependent on him in a way you never were before you, when you were once in Egypt. In those old worldly days, there was always the river of the world to go to. That would perhaps cheer you up a bit or something like that. But you said goodbye to the world and its ways. You ventured out with Jesus. You come into this new life. And there your relationship to God is all important. If you walk with him, he will walk with you. And there'll be lack of nothing. But as it says somewhere in Leviticus, if we walk contrary to him, he will walk contrary to us. And he may think it fit and right to bring us, to restore us, to shut up heaven that there be, no rock, that there be no rain. Yes, it is possible. Only too possible. After we've been blessed as much as we have in these days. For our relationship to God to get wrong on our side. He's always the same, but our relationship to him has gone wrong. Perhaps we've been betrayed into wrong attitudes. Perhaps about the circumstances he's allowed and we're full of self-pity. Or what people do to us and we're full of resentment. Or perhaps we're tempted to compromise with the world and not be bold in our testimony to him when we're out there working in the world. We could begin to play with some sin and we're walking contrary to him. And as I've said, he may well 
shut up heaven, that there be no rain. That's what it says. Then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain, that the land yield not up uh, 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 its fruit. Then, our position is worse as Christians, from one point of view, than it was in the world, from one point of view. Oh, your eternal salvation doesn't vary, but your experience of it may well vary. And you may find that really and truly you're feeling more miserable as a child of God who won't get things right with the Lord than he was when he was in the world. Just think of David. When he had got wrong with God because of his sin with regard to the wife of the husband of Bathsheba, Uriah the Hittite. And when he was unwilling to confess it, he was so miserable. He said, when I waxed, when I was, when I was silent, then my bones waxed old through my groaning all the day long, day and night, thy hand was heavy upon it, upon him. And really and truly, it could be even so with us. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. But it is a fact. A Christian, if he gets wrong in his relationship with God, is unwilling to avail himself of God's appointed way to put things right, which we'll speak about in a moment. He can be more miserable as a Christian than he ever was as an unbeliever. You see, when he was an unbeliever, forgive me repeating, there was always an aisle to go to. There was always a bar or something like that. Or some other amusement of the world. But he said goodbye to all that. He's got something better. But what if, at the, through unbrokenness on his part, he doesn't bow to, to the Lord when he convicts? Then he finds, sometimes, the Lord shuts up heaven that there isn't any rain. And he reads his Bible it is dry as dry as could be. He tries to witness, it's all forced. He comes to the services and where others are praising and melting and shouting their praise to God, he's, he, he's so unhappy, he's so cold. And prayer is a forced thing. Indeed, he very soon begins to give it up. You see what's happened? He's in a time of famine. The rain hasn't fallen. The Spirit hasn't been making the things of God living to him. And for a man who's known the joys of salvation, when that happens, that's a very grievous loss indeed. Amos talks about the days are coming when the Lord's going to send a famine, he said to Israel. Not a famine of water, nor of, uh, uh, of corn, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And what a famine it is when you find yourself in a position when you are ceasing to hear from heaven. You're not hearing from heaven. And, the, and, and because you've known something of the joys of that, your sorrow at being in that position can be even more acute than you ever knew when you were way back in Egypt. So it's a very, a very uh, interesting position. Now, when we find ourselves in that situation, some of us may. Maybe for you yet, not yet, has anything very much happened this week? Maybe you haven't been able to get in on things very much. You're glad to be here tonight. And you say, well, I, I think I'm in, in a time of famine now, if you want to know the truth. Well, it's not a very good situation for a child of God to be in. No, you say it isn't. In fact, some of my unconverted friends seem to have more carefreeness than I do. Yes, understandably so. Well, now, when we're in that situation, what are we to do? Well, I'm going to suggest you have, we have three options open to us. First, we can go on, just as we are, settling for something less than the best, and just going on with famine in our souls, and heaven not sending down the one-time copious rainfall. And you can be in that condition so long that you almost think, well, that is the Christian life. Everybody else is like it. And it's strange that, you know, we have the phrase, birds of a feather flock together. And it's a very strange thing. If you've got a Christian in that condition, he immediately seems to flock with others in the like condition. And he gets the impression that all the Christians are like that. Oh no! Somehow he gravitates to the others so cold and dry. And he gets the, the impression the whole thing's phony. But he can 
say, well, I have to stick it out. I, the whole thing's in the family. I can't quit quite. I'll just go on. And all the time, there's still famine in our souls. The other option is, God forbid, but it's a possibility. You can be so unhappy in your relationship with the Lord and in the Christian life that you really feel like quitting altogether and returning to Egypt and starting drinking of the water of the Nile. Those old things that never really did satisfy you. But the Christian life isn't working for us. And I believe sometimes the reason why we see a person going back into the world after having known the Lord is not because the world is so attractive and so enticing, but simply because, try as they will, they can't get the Christian life to work. So what's the use of uh, keeping on with it? And because of that, they go back to what they know is a complete second best to the things of the world. That is a second option. Please God, we're not going to avail ourselves of that. But the first one isn't much good, is it, going on like that? The third option is the only one open to us really and truly, and that is to avail ourselves of the provision that God has made ahead of time for us when we come into this situation. And there was a provision made for Israel if they came into this situation. And now I'm going to turn you to where that provision was made. I'm thinking of the prayer that Solomon prayed when he had constructed his gorgeous temple. There it was shining in the sun. He had a great platform erected in front of it and upon that platform he kneeled and he prayed. He wasn't content that there should be this beautiful structure. He wanted God to choose it, to sanctify it, to give some sign that he would so choose it because he wanted to know that this was sanctified by the presence of God and above all that prayer made in that place or even toward it would have a special efficacy for Israel when she came into her times of need. And he knew she would. And he longed that there should be a place to which she could always turn and know that turning there and praying toward it or in it, God would hear from heaven, would forgive their, see, their, their sin and relieve them of whatever need they were in. And it's one of the most moving prayers in the Bible. There was Solomon at his best in his youth. There he really was walking with the Lord and in front of everybody he prays that tremendous prayer. There are two records of it. Perhaps the chief one is in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 6. And he tells the Lord, he's saying, Lord, I want you to, I want you to choose this place. I want your eyes always to be a tent so that we can always know where we can turn. A house of sacrifice that will be a place to which we can always have recourse. And then he begins to enumerate the states of need that Israel might get in in coming days. And in 2 Chronicles 6, 26, he says, as one of the states of need, when the heaven is shut up and there is no name, no, no rain, because they have sinned against thee. Yet if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou dost afflict them, then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants. And when thou hast taught them the good way and send a plentiful rain to refresh thine inheritance. So he foresaw this very situation. He goes on, on the other hand, there may be occasions when there's a famine in the land. If there be pestilence or blasting or mildew or locusts or caterpillars, if their enemies besiege them in the cities of their land, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be, then what prayer or what supplications ever shall may be made of any man when every man knows his own, uh, own sore and his own grief and shall spread forth his hands in this house, then hear thou from heaven. 
thy dwelling place, and forgive, and render unto every man according to his ways, etc., etc., and relieve us in our time of distress. He even foresees the possibility, which of course became a fact, of Israel being taken captive. Verse 36, if they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemies, and they carry them away captives unto a land far off or near. Yet if they bethink themselves in the land whither they are carried away captive, and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, we have done amiss, and have dealt wickedly, if they return to thee with all their heart, and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, whither they had been carried away captive, and pray toward their land which thou gavest unto their fathers and toward the city which thou hast chosen and above all toward the house which I have built for thy name then hear thou from heaven and forgive thy people and maintain their cause etc etc it goes on verse after verse and he wanted a place to be chosen a place to be sanctified in these times of discipline, in the time when, as Moses foresaw, heaven might be shut up, where they knew they could be assured that penitence and prayer made toward that place would always avail. They could be sure sin would be forgiven. They could be sure that the heavens would give forth their rain again. how important that place was. I know a place Aye. where sins are washed away. Aye. I know a place where night is turned to day. Aye. Burdens are lifted, blind eyes made to see. There's a wonder-working power in the blood of Calvary. Aye. And in the day when you feel all so dry, when you say that wonderful vision, that wonderful blessing I had way back seems to have disappeared. I want to tell you that place is still there. That place called Calvary. That one called Jesus. That fountain open for sin and uncleanness. It's still there. And it matters not in what state of need you may feel yourself to be in coming days. And you may well be. Solomon knew it may well happen. See, there's, there's always a place. There's always a place. Do you know... That's the reason when Daniel, in faraway Babylon, opened his window three times a day, and he prayed. Do he, he prayed toward Jerusalem. Jerusalem was in ruins, but he prayed toward it, and he was especially thinking of that temple. That too was in ruins, but that's the spot, that's the spot which God has chosen. And dear Daniel, he confessed the nation's sins as his own. And from afar he prayed toward that place. He was counting on that promise. Amen. And in the day when you and I may well feel oh, heaven shut up these days for me. I'm not praising the Lord. I'm not rejoicing. I don't feel really satisfied as I once did. My dear friend, there's a place ahead of time which God has set up for us, custom made for us feeble people who may well get wrong, perhaps in our relationships with others, because what comes between me and others also comes between me and the Lord. But my dear friends, in this land of Canaan, there is this precious provision. Otherwise, it might be very enjoyable for a short time after which it's all gone. But no, there's power in Jesus and his blood right on into the future. We're standing at the door, so to speak, at the boundary of the promised land of the future. It's going to be different. There are joys I'm going to enjoy. I never knew before. Rivers of living water. But there is this possibility that I might get wrong in my relationship with Jesus. And then, momentarily, he might, to bring me back, shut up heaven that all my peace goes and my joy don't despair he knows that's going to happen or may happen and he's provided for it ahead of time do you know Jesus settled for every sin we could possibly commit and did so to the satisfaction of God 
shown by the fact that God raised him from the dead, so satisfied was he with that one offering of himself for sin. He did all that before any of those sins had been committed. So that when they do come into our experience, it's been anticipated. It's been provided ahead of time. And that old cross still speaks of a work for sin and its past still avails for you. All we have to do, in whatever state of soul we may find ourselves in coming day, is to let him show us. And you know it is a revelation. You won't be able to discover wherein you need to repent. It will have to be the Spirit that will reveal it to you. Because sometimes the things that can put our, our, us believers in wrong relationship with Jesus can be very subtle. I'm amazed to hear quite young Christians giving their testimony what God showed them. I tell you, many a psychiatrist could learn. It has not been got from a psychiatrist, it's been revealed by the Spirit. Some subtle attitude, and they've seen it, where it was really self where it's a reaction of a certain sort. Right. Oh, how good God is. And there's a wonderful name that Jesus bears. He's given this title in the first chapter of the book of Revelation. He's called the faithful witness. Right. And I want to tell you, you can hold him to it. Say, Jesus, I don't know where I am. I'm not where I have been. I'm not rejoicing and I'm snapping at the children and I'm... Uh, unkind even to my dear husband and then that of course makes him just as bad towards me or it goes on like that we can get an awful tangle you say Lord I don't understand where we got wrong but they tell me you're, you're the faithful witness will you please be the faithful witness to me he surely will and he's a faithful witness and he can show you what you can never guess and it's an accurate diagnosis. And it's kind. Now you know wherein you can return. Now you know wherein you can get right. And had, when he reveals it to you, he doesn't do it to torture you or to make you more miserable because he's going to show you immediately you agree with him the provision I made ahead of time. Jesus, grace flowing like a river, the power of the precious blood. And the old rain start falling again. And the land of Canaan lives up to every last promise. Right. And I don't know any other way which you're going to get through. I'm going to get through in coming days. I tell you, this gives me good heart. It's so realistic. Jesus knows that we're only in process of being made. We haven't yet grown any wings, have we? He knows where we are. And he's provided ahead of time. It isn't to let to, so, so that you, you can sin with impunity. It is when you're... When you're humble because of sin, there is the remedy all the time. A fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains. The sin is one thing. You stop doing the sin, but the stain remains afterwards. And that which goes, and that it is which goes on accusing you. An accumulation of them, but the blood of Jesus when you're plunged within that flood, you lose all your guilty stains and you cannot be more right with God than what the blood of Jesus makes you when you call sin sin. This is all your righteousness. This is our hope and peace. And there is this precious place. You may find yourself almost being taken captive into a far country. I don't care how far you may feel away from God. Humble yourself in that place. Justify God. Oh God, you're right and I'm wrong. And from that place, you can t look again to Calvary and you look and you live. Do you know, there's a lovely reference to this, exactly this sort of provision in, in, in these terms. In the book of Jonah, the second chapter of the book of Jonah is a record of Jonah's prayer when he was in the belly of the whale. You know, when he was in the belly of the boat, he couldn't pray. Everybody else was praying and the shipmaster went to him, Arise, thou sleeper, and call upon thy God. He couldn't pray because sin had shut his mouth. But he repented that day. He said, What shall we do to you when they lot fell on him? And they said, he said, Well, drown me, cast me overboard. He didn't know there was a, 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 a sort of submarine waiting for him. He rarely pronounced his death sentence. Jonah repented in style. But he found himself in a more difficult situation in the middle of the entrails of that great sea monster. Now when you look at that prayer that Jonah prayed, 
you find that it isn't really much of a prayer at all. It's really a celebration and a thanksgiving to God for having been brought out of the whale. You see, he wrote it after the event, and that filled him so much. But there is one sentence which gives you the prayer that he prayed, and this is the only bit of the actual prayer. Here it is, Then said I, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. That's not poetry. That, he really meant something by it. He recalled the ancient promise that God had provided this place. Amen. And he was in a far off spot, wasn't he? He was in, as he said, the belly of hell. Yeah. He said, now I don't quite know which direction it is. I got a bit disoriented, disorientated down here, but Lord, you, forgive me, I haven't got it quite right. I'm looking that way. And Lord, I'm telling you I was wrong to have done what I did. And Lord, I feel I'm cast, cut off out of thy sight, yet I will look again. And dear one, you may f have find yourself saying, I feel cut off out of his sight these days. Remember, Jonah said, yet I will look again. Right. And my dear friend, when you look again, you'll see the one who loved you before still loves you. The one who forgave you before still ready to forgive. The one who clothed you before is still ready to apply that precious blood again. And out of the belly of the whale you'll come, rejoicing and praising again. Because if I'm not willing, then I may find the heaven shut up. But the moment I say, Lord, I'm wrong, and look in the eye of faith to Calvary, and get there by faith, yeah. I tell you, you're back again. Hey. One last thing, and then I must close. And it's this. <coughs> when my first wife was still alive, I remember picking up her Bible, and finding in the flyleaf a list of what, as I read it, purported to be a list of sins, rather subtle ones. She'd put down worrying. She'd put down blaming and nagging. So I suppose I was involved in that one. And perhaps she had felt that she sometimes blamed me. I usually had to feel that I was probably wrong, but anyway, she'd put it down, blaming, and she called it nagging. Then she put down tenseness, and she told me that she'd learned to see tenseness, being tense as a sin. It caused many other things too, she always said. And there was a whole lot of things, rather subtle ones. And I said, what's the meaning of that list? Oh, she says, those are the things that God has shown me to be sin. And I keep that list there to be able to ask myself, am I still seeing them as sin? Now, that's really rather deep. You might say, I'm keeping that list there to see whether I'm getting the victory over it, whether they're ever coming back. No, no, that wasn't the point. They might well come back. What she wanted to check up on was she still calling tenseness sin. Was she still calling resentment? sin? Was she still calling blaming the other person sin? What a deep thing. And my dear friends, that's the thing. In these days we've learned to call some things sin we never did call sin. Yeah. Pam shared her testimony about self-consciousness and feeling inferior as a sin, the reverse form of pride. What are people thinking of me? And her testimony, as you doubtless heard, meant that when she called it sin, she took, was able to take it to the fountain. Now these Maybe some of us have had that sort of revelation. Maybe some of us have had the revelation that our resentment toward other people who did wrong toward us, that was sin. It's very easy not to see it as sin. If they're so wrong, you can't see that your reaction is wrong too, even worse. Now the great thing is this, 
Are you willing to go on seeing those things as sin? It's possible not to. It's possible to cease to see these things God showed us in these days as sin, to cease to see them as sin. I imagine they might come again. The point is not uh, do they come or do they not, but when they do, do you still call them by that old name? Because it's easy to ease up, to come to terms. You wonder why the heavens aren't dropping down the, the rain of heaven as they once had in. It may be something you've dealt with these days and called it by that hard name. I'm the one that's wrong, not the other. You've ceased to call that. But oh, here's the way. I must needs go home by the way of the cross, the blood-sprinkled way, and on that way I have to call things by their name. And the moment I do, they're finished with and I'm back on course enjoying that land of milk and honey and so there is our picture and I don't I'm not immune Pam and I may have our times when we feel heaven is shut up and when he will humble us and I want to tell you when we're going to look again toward that old place of sacrifice chosen and sanctified for just people like us. I know a place where sins are washed away. You know, the great secret of the Christian life is knowing what to do with sin. Because that's the great thing. I'm not going to worry for the moment. Are you doing it or aren't you? Do you know what to do with it? Or are you going to lie down with it and be accused by it? Are we going to look again toward that holy temple and again and again just as often as we need and so we find we begin to enjoy consistently the land that flows with milk and honey amen and amen amen let's sing our chorus thank you God for sending Jesus and for this place thank you God thank you Jesus that you came Holy Spirit won't you tell us more about his lovely name we were singing this this morning thank you God for sending Jesus thank you Jesus that you came Holy Spirit won't you there are going to be hours of need when all you need is for the Holy Spirit to tell you more about that lovely name, about that gracious deed that he, he did for you, about the continuing efficacy of that blood for you. Oh, you need to see it again. The devil will try and confuse you and get you struggling again, but he will do it. Let's sing it. Thank you, God, for sending Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Holy Spirit, won't you tell us more about his lovely name? Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer.